We've reached another point in our journey of reloading these 223s on the Dillon 1050. And that's where it's time to make a decision about the bullet, the primer, and the powder that we're gonna use in these loads that we're gonna be putting together here on the, on the Dillon. Now, I could just grab three that work and, you know, that are known to work and put them together and that's fine. But at the same time, I thought, well, you know what, this might be a great opportunity to do a little further exploration and go into this great detail that I was talking about earlier. So, <clears throat> starting with a bullet. Uh, back, back around 2012, when certain political events were going on, it became very difficult to get components. You, you, for example, you couldn't buy 22s pretty much anywhere, and uh, you couldn't get 9mm or 380s went, went out, and things like that. Components were also hard to get, and that included bullets, and I had a couple of bolt action 22 caliber, uh, 223 and a 22 250 that I loaded for, and I was looking for some 224 bullets. The only thing I could find were these Nosslers, and it's a 40 grain ballistic tip. And I bought a, a box here of a thousand. And kind of see what I'm talking about here. Well, <clears throat> that's fine, and, and, and they're great in, the, in those bolt guns. What I wasn't sure about was what would happen if I wanted to load that in the, for an AR-15, because the spin rate is so high, and I was afraid that you can get this little 40-grain pill going 3,800 feet per second out of a one and seven barrel, you'd have you know, lead smoke out a few feet in front of your rifle. But anyway, I didn't do anything with it. <clears throat> but the other day I saw a video and I think it's Johnny Reloading, maybe that's the name of this. I'll put a link down below. And he was loading this exact bullet with a couple of powders and he had great success with both in a one in seven twist AR-15. I said, well, heck, I got a gazillion of these on hand. Let's, let's, let's give it a whirl. So that's how I chose the bullet. Now, as to the powder, the AR, the, the 223 5.56, it, it has a lot of powders. It's a, the most popular rifle cartridge. So there's a lot of powders that work with it. And I went through my inventory, and look what I found, 12 that will work with th that cartridge and that 40 grain bullet. Now, all I am using is published loads, published by the powder companies, the bullet companies. N none of this stuff where you get <laughs> a forum and the guy says, somebody says, anybody got suggestion for a good powder for a 223 with a 40 grain Nosler ballistic tip? First answer. My buddy, okay, <clears throat> he had good luck with a couple of sticks of dynamite and, you know, whatever. It's, it's always that. It's always that hearsay. That's not fair to the really good forums, and there are plenty of them out there. Uh, High Road and uh, now here I've said one and I can't think of the others. There are about four or five. <clears throat> and, and, and these guys really give good advice and so forth. Nevertheless, and, and in fact, I did read them and I got some good notions about what was working. So I went to the powder manufacturers and all of these are, are rated. Got a Vitavuri N133 and that may be a little bit off, but hey, they've got it listed with a 40 grain ballistic tip bullet. So couple of 4198s, an IMR and an H, and they are different, even though they have the same number. Uh, the loads for them will be slightly different, and maybe one will have an advantage over the other. I've got a good bit of it, so let's hope one of them works well. Hogden CFE 223, newish, came out, what, 10 years ago, something like that. And it's copper fouling eraser. <clears throat> uh, some people think if you don't run it hot, it gets, it's kind of dirty, even though it keeps the copper fouling out of your barrel. Varget and Benchmark are two popular 
uh, powders from Hogden for rifles of all shapes and sizes, and they right there on the front, they got loads for 223s. Winchester 748 ball powder. That's, that's a real popular one for folks doing high volume loading, especially when it's real fast on progressive machines where the powder has very little time to drop. And that stuff flows like water. I mean, it's a, it's a very fine ball. Well, a lot of these are that way. They, they, all of these, will, it, it will be important that they all flow well. Reloader 10X, absolutely, it's listed. Reloader 7, this is the powder that Johnny Reloader had the best results with. He was shooting one whole groups with this. Not super high velocity, but hey, plenty, plenty high. And uh, we'll see, we'll see. Three others from Hogman, the H335 and the H322. And all these are ball. And uh, the BLC2, which was developed, as I understand it, originally for the... 308, 7.62 NATO, that ball powder, it would meter well and so forth. Well, they tried it, of course, in the 5.56, and yeah, it works great there too. So we have a dozen powders. Now, here's what I plan to do. I plan to load them on 12 of these, I'll have them grouped on 12 of these blocks, one for each powder. For example, here's one for the H335, it's just dummied up right now and empty, of course. <clears throat> and what we'll have is we'll have three different loads for each powder, a low, middle, and high. The low being the published starting load, middle being an in-between ground, and high being the published maximum load. And to be honest, I can't remember if I chose the hottest <laughs> or the not hottest if there was more than one publication with it. But generally, I stuck with the powder makers in their recommendations. They tend to be a little on the mild side. That's good. That's fine. No problem with that. What happened is we'll load 10 rounds with each load, and we'll shoot 10-shot groups. Um, I, I, you know, you can argue this all you want to. That's fine. It's, it's my opinion that to get a really reasonably statistically accurate result, you need a bigger sample than five. You sure need a bigger one than three. Now, on the other hand, I will freely admit that five would give us an idea of what it can do, probably, uh, unless there was some shooter error involved. I, you know, who knows? But anyway, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I'm going with 10 for each, so <clears throat> we'll have 12 of these little trays, which are, by the way, those styrofoam inserts that you get from Midway and others to put your ammo in. This happens to be 38, 357 size, which is just this absolutely exquisite fit for the, um, for the 223. Mm -hmm. And, um, so this will help us keep it organized. There'll be 12 of these trays, 30 per tray, 360 rounds total. Probably take more than one trip to the range. Now, this raises a point. Here's, here we're going to have a powder. We're going to load 30 rounds and then switch to a different powder. Now, if you know anything about Dillon powder measures, you know that's not a trivial thing. Furthermore, we're going to load one setting here, and then we're gonna bump it up to another one here. If, again, if you know anything about powder measures in general, you know that when you change, you've gotta go through a weighing cycle and fine tune it until you get it in there. And this just doesn't seem like something that will work on a 1050 or any other progressive. However, I have a plan, and let's move forward, and I'll show you what I got in mind. Well, the answer is this. That's right, an electronic powder measure. And in this case, specifically, an RCBS uh, Charge Master 1500, I think one of the early ones that came out. I love this thing for this kind of work. Uh, you change the charge weight just simply by punching in a new number, and that's it. It's going to weigh the charge every time, so there's no setting up, no testing, no fumbling around with all that. And then when it comes time to 
change out the powder, you just simply turn it around, open up the little deal on the side and pour it off. It's a funnel probably, but you know. Takes about a minute or so to change powders, minute and a half, I don't know, but not long. And unlike changing powders on a, a typical drum type or uh, whatever you call it, sliding cavity type of powder measure, you don't have to spend a lot of cycle time cleaning it out getting rid of the last residue of whatever whatever you had in there before. So it just just a quick squirt with the air and you're done. The thing is though, how do you make this work with this? And this is where I've got my idea. Each time you run a charge, it'll dump it all off in a little pan. So there's our pan. So how do we get that to a case in here? And this is where I had this idea. You take a high quality uh, Saturn custom machining 22 caliber uh, funnel. And then these things are fitted with a brass uh, lower side here that fits down into it, see? And so it's, it's, a, it's a nice fit. And it's heavy, so so the weight holds it. You don't have to hold on to it. No, okay. So what happens is, we'll put it right up here. Now let's move in close. And you'll see this. So we have our case, and it's just sitting here in station number two. That's number one. Back up under here, by the way, in case you're wondering. And our first piece of brass comes around. Now watch. There it is. Take our little charge goody, dump in our powder, put it back down, and it will at that point begin refilling. Now watch. Goes around, another one has appeared here, of course. Should have had two in there. And then we just do it again. And it works like that every time, over and over and over. It rings it. <laughs> Just a bit of fortunate happenstance, but, but it works. Now, in order to do this, I couldn't put it back here where the powder thing goes because look, it, it goes wanky on the side of the uh, primer tube and it gets in the way of whatever I want to put here, which in this case, a bullet feeder followed by a seating die followed by a crimping die. And back here ultimately will be the powder measure, but for this purpose, we could have put it there, but for the fact that everything else is in the way. So I've got to put it up here in one of these. However, the case won't get primed until it gets back here. And as you know, putting ball powder in an unprimed case is just going to lead to a mess. It'll just go right through it. It's like water. I ran the Dillon with absolutely nothing operational except for the primer system. It's the world's most expensive priming device. It goes really fast, and with the Dillon primer filling machine running while I was priming, it was a non-stop operation. It only took a few minutes to prime the 400 cases that I wanted for the load development. Yes, I know, I only need 360 cases, but you know it's better to have a few extra on hand for any kind of reloading operation. Okay, I freely admit we will be spending time waiting on the powder measure, the electronic powder measure to trickle out each load, and that's gonna slow us down. However, that will also give us time to take our time, look at what we're doing very carefully, and not get mixed up. Are we doing the lows, the middles, or the highs? You know, this sort of thing. So now we're back to the actual loading operation. I printed out a chart of all the powders and loads so I could check off as I went and thus keep up with everything. Like so many things with reloading, paper trail is extremely important. 
you need to label everything and you keep as many notes as possible because it is a certain fact. You will forget what's what by the next time you pick up that box of cartridges. I think you've seen by now how smoothly the funnel works with this system, even if it does occasionally miss the mark, you have plenty of time to put it right before the powder measure beeps with the next load. I had to do some fine tuning on my Mr. Bullet feeder because these little 40 grain bullets are pretty short. I'm using a Forster match type seating die to seat the bullets. Most of the die makers these days offer this type of seating die where you have the sliding part on the inside and that maintains an alignment between the bullet and the case all the way up to the point where the bullet is pressed into the case. That fancy micrometer setting dial on top, in this case, it's more eye candy than practical necessity. But if you're loading match ammo for a particular rifle, it will prove invaluable in fine tuning the bullet seating depth to find the sweet spot for that individual rifle. Like most of the match bullet seeders, this die provides no crimping. So I crimp the cartridge in the final station with an RCBS taper crimp. This is actually an RCBS bullet seeder die that includes crimping. However, I backed off the bullet seating plug, so all it does is crimp. Many people like the Lee factory crimp die, but in my experience, it tends to work best with bullets that have a cantalure or crimping band. But either way, I think you'll get best results if you use a separate seating and crimping die combination. We're in the home stretch now, so this is as good a time as any to wrap up the video. The next episode will be where we go to the range and, and shoot these things and find out what kind of good or bad or otherwise that we're going to learn about them. And then that way we can make a decision about what to load up a lot of. And I just didn't want to invest a lot of money, time, and effort into something less than the best that we could do. I've done nine so far, two, four, six, eight, nine. This is number 10, the Varget, and then there are two more to follow. It's going pretty good. Uh, it's slower than I thought it would be, of course it is, but it's not that bad. It takes, realistically, it takes about 30, 45 minutes to do one of these containers, and that's labeling things and checking your notes, putting the powder in, adjusting, taking it out, loading, and so forth. Um, you know, these things are kind of slow. You spend a lot of time waiting on the, um, on the powder measure to uh, catch up with you. I've seen videos with people loading on uh, Dillon 1050s and other big progressive machines using these but they would have three or maybe four of them going at one time. And, and so that gives you an idea of, uh, you know, it, it, you really can outrun it a lot. But it's, it's not so bad. And uh, I also had thought that I would have to kind of keep up with how many cartridges up front. That is to say, pre-stack 10 cases into the into the uh, into the hopper here and then turn off the case feeder you don't really have to do that uh, it's easy enough to uh, to keep count turns out uh, you know you'll be going progressing 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 until finally you start getting some out on the other end well at that point you'll be putting them in here and when you have three that's it just block it off at that point and finish out because that'll give you 10. Um, there are always seven, you know, in the loading cycle on the, on the press. That eighth stage is, is where the case goes in and nothing really happens there. It just over. So it, it never dwells in that station zero, as I call it. So uh, I guess that's a wrap on this. Thank you for watching, and uh, I'm sorry there's been such a delay in time between these videos. I don't really mean for that to happen, but I just get caught up doing other things, and, and then 
I'm, I have the attention span of a, a very young cocker spaniel, I think. I, I just, I, I, I get too many things going at one time. I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to fix this, I want to fix this. And I got that 3D printer, so, you know, excuses, excuses, that doesn't help you, but uh, th there are reasons and nothing bad, just uh, doing a lot of other things. But anyway, uh, the weather is really, 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 really hot right now in August, and, um, I, you know, I'm going to see what I can do about getting these things out to the range and shooting them. Uh, I know of a range that has uh, air conditioning. I, I, I'm talking about an outdoor range, but the shooting room has air conditioning. You shoot out through a, an opening. Uh, if it doesn't get any cooler and I need to get going on this, that's where I'm gonna go. But otherwise, I'll be going over to East Alabama and we'll shoot over there and we'll find out. Thank you, thank you for watching. Subscribe if you will. Uh, what are you supposed to do? Uh, check like if you liked it, ring the bell, that sort of thing. You know what to do. Thanks, bye.